Gigi Alcock, it's really good to see you. Man, we're not going to see you at the conference this time, but I hope six months' time maybe we'll get you back in the Drakensberg. Yeah, absolutely. We never. Lots yeah. happening in the informal space. We haven't spoken for a while. Yeah. Uh, the Just off air, we were talking about a land grab that's going on now where finally, it seems, corporate South Africa is waking up to the uh, exciting opportunities in what you've been talking about, the Kasi economy. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, we spoke in, in the probably middle of lockdown, we still had to wear masks and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, no one in the township, of course, or in the informal economy was wearing a mask. Uh, but yeah, there's been this really, uh, you know, the, the, that sector is booming. It's, it's, it's doing really well for a number of reasons. Um, and, and, and which has actually kind of prompted, I think, a lot of companies, retailers and so on to enter into that space. And, and maybe just to say, why is it booming? You know, to a large extent, what has happened is things like cost of transport, things like lockdowns have, in essence, created a, a situation where people are shopping locally. Uh, I talk a lot about now Gasipolitans, people who are very rooted in the township from everything, from entertainment, shopping, and that kind of thing. And kind of COVID stay at home stuff meant people started, you know, already looking around themselves in terms of where I go shopping and where I go for my hair and, and so on. Uh, and it's kind of coincided with things like the cost of fuel and, and uh, the inconvenience of you know, taxi costs and, and inconvenience. If you go to the shopping center, uh, queues are, are like since COVID, it's just insane. People shopping stand, center in, in Yeah, locations. in the townships. Yeah. People are standing for 40 minutes to two hours in long queues. Do you call it locations? I mean, you call it kasi. I call it kasi. Yeah. I mean, I guess when we look at the informal economy, we almost have to separate the informal economy and then the township economy. And within the township economy, it's increasingly difficult to define what is a township. So you've got the historical townships. And if you look at Soweto as an example, there were 29 suburbs in Soweto. Now there's 35 suburbs. And, and those new suburbs like Protea or like, you know, they're not really a township. They're like, uh, you know, townhouses and clusters and, and, and that. And then, of course, many of the townships have kind of spread into surrounding areas, places like Naturina and, and so on. Whether, wherever the townships are, the kind of neighboring old white suburbs have become very much kind of gasified. You find a car wash there and, and, and a Shisanyama and stuff. You know, people um, who yeah. haven't met Gigi Alcock before, are probably listening to this like cheap as this guy's uh, well informed. Uh, yeah. How come? <laughs> well, I mean, I've you know spent my life in those spaces, and I still uh, spend a huge amount of time in in the townships. Uh, I'm doing business in the townships. I give advice to to uh, companies or corporates that want to do work in there. Um, I sold my business in Anawe, which was the kind of first and probably largest business that did marketing, distribution, strategies, things for, for anyone wanting to, to do work in that space. Um, but I've continued there. So when I sold my business, I've a, invested in some businesses in the township space or trading within that space. Um, also some kind of products like a Muti product and, and so on, um, a herbal medicine product. Um, and now I can and, see that people are there. Ah, oh, yes, he's the guy who grew up grew up in Masinga with the parents that's who right. were yep. spoken about in Rian Milan's book and so on. Okay, so now, right, yeah. now we've got, and Gigi, your yep. name, Gigi, you've got to repeat why. Because <laughs> your real name's Mark, is it? It used to be Mark, but I actually <laughs> went and changed my name to Gigi. So, yeah, I mean, very short, I was named after the government trucks that were removing people. And um, and they had a registration, government garage or Gigi, and it was called, you know, Skatska Gigi, the time of Gigi. And and my mother had me on her hip winch as a baby, um, as as uh, she was trying to fight forced removals and stop the government removing people. So named after after that that so time. So this is your world. You uh, deeply deep <clears throat> in there, and yeah. and you've been talking for a long time about the informal yeah. economy and how the formal yeah. economy and the media generally, I suppose you could call it, are ignoring yeah. the, the reality of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, my second business book was called Gasinomic Revolution because I said there's a revolution happening in informal economies throughout Africa. The scale of those economies is, is un, untapped and, and really unrealized. 
Uh, and equally, you know, these figures around unemployment are absolute rubbish because no one's considering uh, businesses, uh, um, uh, other forms of income that are actually being earned in those kind of spaces. So you're saying that, that <clears throat> youth unemployment is not over 50%? I, I in 2019, um, found something where I told you in 2019 that unemployment was closer to 12% and I'd stick to the same number now. And and uh, you know, so 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 I mean, just to dwell on the unemployment figures, uh, um, you know, I've said around twelve percent real unemployment. And if you want to take the figures of say forty percent that are touted around, you've got to place the word formal unemployment in front of that word, because uh, that reflects to uh, people who earn a pay slip, you know, who have a pay slip and and earn a salary or a wage. Um, if you look outside of that, if you look at this massive informal economy, the Spaza sector is 150 billion rand sector, fast food is a 90 billion rand a year sector, the taxi industry is a 50 billion rand a year sector, traditional herbal medicines are 18 billion rand sector, hair salons are 10 billion rand sector, none of them have pay slips. Then over and above that, there's a lot of passive income that we don't measure. So for instance, uh, all those spazers are primarily uh, foreigners or immigrant traders. They pay 25 billion rand a year in rental to South African owners of the houses that their spaza is on. Uh, there's another 20 billion rand a year backroom rental sector, which is a booming sector. So many people are sitting with, say, between three and six backrooms. They're earning two and a half thousand rand a month these per are, room. These are big numbers, and you've spoken about them a lot. Yeah. But is that economy, the informal economy, yeah. is that growing? Absolutely it is. And in fact, if you look, so let's just use backrooms as an example. Everyone said to me, well, why would it be backrooms? So my question to you know, people is often, you know, is it true that uh, house, uh, townships have large households? And everyone's like, yeah, six or eight people per household. Well, South African General, SA General Household Survey, which is Stats SA, shows that 25.7% of households are one person households. And 50% of households are under three people per household. So 70 odd percent of households in South Africa are either 1% or under three people per household. Now, if you're a one person household, so first of all, it puts a lie to the fact um, that, uh, and both of you and I are fans of factfulness. You know, factfulness, yes. he speaks about historical bias. Fact is over there. There's the book. There you go, yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, and Hans Rosling talks about historical bias. Don't be biased by what used to be true 10 or 20 years ago. And this was true 20 years ago. I mean, also don't be, be swayed by anecdotal or media bias, which tells you a story of a granny who lives with eight kids grandchildren and absolute poverty in a shack, and then extrapolate that to say it's representative of the total population. So, so yes, those stories are true. Yes, there are unemployed people. Yes, there are poor people. Yes, there are people who live in shacks. But 80 odd, 86% of households in South Africa live in formal dwellings. So informal dwellings represents a tiny minority. Uh, households in general are one person households or three to four people. And why is that important? That's important because when you look at it, increasingly, if you're in a small household, you start spending more money on yourself um, and you start buying smaller pack sizes. So I've heard retailers say consumers are under pressure because they're buying smaller pack sizes. Are they buying smaller pack sizes because they, their budgets are under pressure or because they're actually one or three people households? So one person doesn't need 12 kgs of flour or rice or whatever. They need a, a, you know, a, a two kgs. So the other thing, and, and, we, and, and, and so people spending more on self, spending more on comfort, if you live in a formal house, you start spending on things like a couch and a flat screen TV and, and whatever. You're not spending on keeping the rain out and the cold out and so on. And we see this. I mean, uh, the, the, the building and, and uh, furnishing industry in the townships just really booming. Other thing we see it in is in, um, in hair care and uh, nails. I mean, the hair salon sector is, is booming. Supply to that sector by companies supplying So it. spending on me. I'm spending on mm. me. Uh, and um, and um, <clears throat> if we look at the hair salon sector, uh, if we look at the fast food sector, you know, I built a three billion rand business for Parmalat in the a year business uh, for Parmalat in the cheese slices going into the township quarter and fed cook sector. Um, that's booming. Why is it booming? Because again, you know, if you're a small household, why would you go and cook? We all know this. Uh, but but uh, Gigi, it sounds to me like. There are a lot of entrepreneurs who must be involved in this because yeah. of the, 
the, the numbers that you're talking about, clearly there are individuals, there are people who are supplying the services and the goods yeah. that make up those numbers. Yeah. So, so I mean, if we look at the household, that, that, sorry, the, the, um, if you look at the um, wholesale sector, the wholesale sector is booming. Mm. Um, if you look at, uh, look, let's look at the retailers. So uh, ShopRite is investing heavily in YouSave and YouSave Egasi. YouSave is in essence a local neighborhood shop. YouSave Egasi, I should have registered the term Egasi, um, is a container-based uh, uh, offering. Container-based? Uh, it's a container that's basically got a, a mini YouSave in it. So so what we- So it's like a little spa as a shop, but it's formally owned so because it's from- so from it's a ShopRite shop owned um, store. How many of those um, are there? Oh, I don't know. But across the U saves, I think they've got 250 odd U saves, maybe more, maybe 280 U uh, saves, which are the smaller format versus the kind of shop rights, which are the large format, lower, smaller range of SKUs and stuff like that. Um, so these containers. Great, great insight, you know, that they've yeah. recognized, which I've said for a long time. First of all, that the what I call a spaza ret, which is a supermarket type spaza, um, has really disrupted the space. They've really shaped local neighborhood shopping in walking distance from you, well-priced, wide range of products, generally owned by an Ethiopian or Somali. That sector has really reshaped neighborhood shopping. Uh, so of course, what's the response to that? Um, ShopRite, very good insight, recognize that with this format. Pick and Pay has just announced that they're going to launch a Pick and Pay Red format. So are they competing with the Ethiopians? That's the only competition. They're not competing with each other. The people who are giving them a run for the money are the Ethiopians and Somalis and some Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. And, you know, seven years, eight years ago, I was saying to, to these, uh, and, I, uh, you know, I do help uh, develop strategy for many of these retailers. Um, is uh, I said, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, I said, guys, this is the next big retail sector. And everyone laughed at me. And in the last two years, I've had uh, similar people coming to me and said, it has come to be, what is the strategy? Um, and so, um, you know, th that that sector is retail. And that's just the spaza sector. Then we look at, you know, the, as you know, there's many others, the fast food sector is getting- But it is interesting. If you have a look on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, yeah. the two best performing shares, company shares, yeah are Capitec, which uh, focuses on that sector, yeah. and Transaction Capital, yeah. which focuses on that yeah, sector yeah. as well. And, and they continue yeah. to boom. They were obviously early to market, but from what you're saying now, other yeah. parts of corporate South Africa are waking up to that opportunity. Yeah, so, so look, uh, as I said, Pick and Pay is launching into that space. Um, uh, you, 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 I think you've even reported on Mr. Price buying out uh, Power Fashion, uh, you know, most people never heard of Power Fashion. Uh, I did some work with them a few years ago. Power Fashion is a is a business of kind of affordable fashion wear in townships or in informal kind of environments. Uh, they bought Studio 88. Everyone's like, who's Studio 88? They've paid, I think, 3 billion rand for. Again, what's the insight? The insight's brilliant. The insight is an understanding of the fact that A, consumers in this, call it Gassi sector, the township economy, are, are doing better, have more money um, than, than the kind of, you know, these dramatic headlines tell you. The second part about it is this recognition of, of local uh, purchases happening in what I call township high streets. If you look at the main arterials in the townships, increasingly businesses aggregating around that, that's where the footfalls are, that's where consumers are shopping. So COVID um, has changed many people's minds and thinking on that. You don't yeah. now have to get into a taxi and come into the city. Yeah. Look, it was happening before. And I mean, I can, you know, I wrote about it in, in Gasinomic Revolution, which came out in 2018, that's growth of local neighborhood, the smaller, you know, smaller households, all of these kind of things. But COVID just, just accelerated that dramatically, which is done in many, many other um, elements. And so, uh, I mean, so if you look at, uh, and that's the township space. So, so what I did is, for instance, I developed a, a, a database. There's 530 townships in South Africa, historical townships. It sounds daunting. I built a, a database of the 80, of 80 what I call townships and township clusters. So if you looked, for instance, at uh, north of Pretoria, there's a township, Soshanguve, 
and next door to it, or part of it is Mabopane, Kharango, or Winterfelt. That's what I call a township cluster. Because if you drive through that, there's, you know, Soshengulve doesn't end and you drive and suddenly you enter Mabopane. It's one geographic space and one economic ecosystem. So I developed this model um, of, of 80 townships and township clusters. Now, if you look at that, that represents 80% odd of our urban um, turnovers um, and economic activity. If you're not in those spaces, you you kind of out. Uh, did you? I want to. If, I can just add yeah. parallel to that. Yeah. Is um, there's about a hundred rural towns now. There's more than two thousand rural towns in South Africa, but there's kind of a hundred rural towns where there is extraordinary economic activity happening. Those are places like Pongola, uh, Burgess Fort, Mkanduli, Pudelichaba. And um, so again, develop this kind of database of 100 rural towns, which are, you know, we talk a lot about how these towns, rural towns, small towns are dying. And yes, those are dying where they don't have a huge population that's actually built, aggregated and moved around those spaces. But if you go to Pongola, I was in, uh, I went to Zanin on, on uh, last weekend, and you drive past uh, what used to be Turflup University, you drive for 15 kilometers, of beautiful western size you know houses um and uh, hardware stores long as as far as you can go and that's what i would call a rural town where an amount of economic activity happening in those rural towns look at the performance of boxer as an example but Cyril Ramaphosa is creating 500 black industrialists yeah. is he going into informal areas yeah. and pulling out the most successful of these entrepreneurs who yeah. clearly have made it on their own without any support. Yeah. You know, the tragedy is that, um, you know, the, the the government, the ANC, I guess, um, uh, they don't see this. They don't understand um, a modern uh, economy. So, you know, they're going to talk about industrialists and, and, and this kind of thing. And if they were wanting to do this, they should be going and creating chains of of supermarkets, of spazarets, as I was talking about, to compete with the shop right, as an example. But, um, you know, and I, and I talk a lot about, I, I've, I, I mentor, I help a lot of township entrepreneurs doing amazing stuff. I mean, one guy, as an example, supplies um, catering stuff to, to um, he, he does about a million rand a month and he supplies about a hundred township fast food outlets with chicken packaging material, cooking oil and stuff. Gopano cannot get anyone to help him, not in government. I've introduced him to people at the NYDA, CIFA, whatever it might be. And why? Because, because he's an entrepreneur doing it on his own. Um, he's he's not um, connected. He's not connected. He he's not turning over, you know, like, you know, they'd rather lend someone, you know, a hundred million rand to go in and and, and buy out, say, a white industrialist or or, or that kind of thing. And and actually, where does the, you know, the future's in small, medium enterprises I hope worldwide. Someone like Herman Mashaba, yeah. he understands as he built a business from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very difficult when you get a socialist and say to a socialist, well, start creating a, <laughs> yeah, an yeah, economy. And look, the ANC do look come at, from look that Look at the background. DNA of the ANC is a Stalinist kind of, you know, Soviet type thing. And that's why they'll talk industrialists. The, the ANC can't get their head around, and I've look. I've engaged with many people at all these levels. I came from the ANC in many ways, and and the kind of um, UDF kind of thing. And the problem is, is that they 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 cannot see, they cannot understand, they don't understand capitalism. They certainly don't understand um, um, kind of independent. Um, business, free enterprise. Free enterprise. Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. understand it. You know, I often say it's not the informal economy, it's the independent economy where these independent entrepreneurs and business people, and entrepreneur is almost the wrong word because most, you know, entrepreneur for me is someone who's innovating, starting a whole new kind of tech business or something. These are actually business people and they're medium sized business people who are trying to scale their businesses. There's no help for them out there, nothing at all. And that's where the help should be. That's where the help should be. We should be growing those businesses. And I've got examples mm. of how a small amount of help to these businesses can actually completely transform them. And we've seen it happen in other countries, certainly in Bangladesh with uh, uh, Grameen, Grameen Bank, for Bank. instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of, lots yeah, of yeah, examples. Yeah. You don't have to reinvent any wheels. Gigi, before we finish though, for today, the inflation rates now come out at 7.5%. Yeah. You've spoken about unemployment being a nonsense number. Yeah. Uh, is the inflation number nonsense or do people in the 
uh, gas economy also take account of this? Yeah. So I think that the inflation, uh, inflation certainly there, and people are feeling it, and they're particularly feeling it in things like the cost of cooking oil, um, the cost of of transport, um, getting deliveries from the wholesaler to your store, taxi fares, and those kind of things certainly affecting people. Um, interestingly, though, it's got a le- it's it's got a lesser impact on people in that kind of space for a few reasons. I mean, the one is that if you look at the fast food sector. Um, I've got a friend who's at the market who's a, an, an agent who does potato sales and you know 60, 70 percent of sale of, of the municipal fruit and veg market sell to the informal sector. Um, and I was like, okay, cooking oil's gone through the roof. Are people making less slip chips for their quarters and for their you know fish and chips and chicken and chips and stuff like that? There's no impact on it. So so the potato sales are in fact going through the roof, continue to go through the roof to the sector among others so so what's are, happening are, are they just passing on the, the pe- cost people no they absorb they're making a smaller margin and a lot of those business actually make far higher margins than than you realize you know they've got lower overheads they're often 80 percent of informal businesses are operating from a residential premises or have taken a residential premises and they haven't got too high taxes that they worry about yeah as well. look they pay vat and they don't claim they do. vat Oh, well, they pay you know, VAT on, on what their purchases. Yeah. They don't claim VAT, so that's a fifteen percent, you know, which would equal. Don't I underestimate guess. that. It's a huge number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So through. you know, there's a net benefit to the fiscus of VAT payments without any claims. Um, so yes, of course, they're not paying tax um, and 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 so on. But yes, people are feeling it, and uh, like everyone does. But it is not a um, kind of mortal blow in in many ways, and it has it impacts less on informal businesses. I love talking to you because you always uplift my spirits, uh, despite the gloomy There's headlines. There's a great story out there. And I, you know, I spend my time there all the time. And every time I take people into that kind of space, business people, they come away going like, why have we got all this doom and gloom? Because the reality is that these spaces are continuing despite this. They they are technology enabled. They um, you know doing good business, making good money. Uh, investing it into their homes and and, uh, and and environments and into their businesses. And and they kind of are shrugging and ignoring everything and certainly ignoring the government and just carrying on building the sector. And and it's an invigorating space where there's, there's real, real um, economic activity. Gigi Alcock is uh, an expert on the informal economy. Read his books. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. <laughs>